Well, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, super disappointed that we all can't be together in person, but it's awesome that so many people are able to take advantage of this, uh, this workshop. And thanks for the organizers for doing this. So uh, today I'm going to talk about metabolomics um, very generally. So looking at the program of the workshop, you guys have gotten a lot of proteomics, um, a lot of sort of general mass spec um, introduction. And so today, oh, advance my slides. There we go. We're going to really, uh, our goal is to really kind of talk about this field of metabolomics in general. What is it? How is this different from some of the other mass spec applications that you've talked about this week? Um, and then we're going to focus specifically on some of the challenges and limitations that are uh, unique to metabolomics. OK, so we'll start with some basic definitions. Uh, metabolomics, what is it? Metabolites can be defined as the substrates um, or products of metabolism. Um, so essentially, they are the biologically active small molecules, or in other words, everything other than DNA, RNA, and proteins that are in our biological system. Um, importantly, these metabolites can be host-derived, but they can also come from dietary or microbial sources, and we'll talk a little bit more about the importance of that in a little bit. Uh, the metabolome, then, would be the collection of all metabolites in a biological system. And we can use this word in various ways to describe sort of the entire metabolome of a biological system, or you could describe like sub-metabolomes of like, if we're talking about a root or a plant, you might say the root metabolome or the leaf metabolome um, and so on. And then metabolomics would be the analytical method that we use to identify and characterize uh, these metabolites. So in my laboratory, we like to consider ourselves to be ecosystem impartial. Um, we have a huge range of projects studying uh, lots of different biological systems. So for example, we have projects looking at sorghum, which is a plant that's grown for both food production as well as a, as a biofuel feedstock. Uh, <clears throat> we have projects looking at all sorts of different types of food. So it, these include uh, animal products, um, fruits and vegetables, uh, fermented beverages. Uh, we look at microbes, and these could be microbial communities, both in the human gut or in the soil. And then, and then also human clinical samples, including feces, urine, and plasma. At the end of the day, no matter what ecosystem we're studying, we end up with a tube full of biological materials that contains a bunch of molecules that we need to analyze. So why do we do metabolomics? And by we, I mean collectively, why do we all do metabolomics? Um, so again, metabolites are essentially a functional or chemical readout of a biological phenotype, right? So where our genes can tell us the potential of a system and the proteomics tell us who's there and doing the work in other words mostly the enzymes the metabolites really tell us what's actually happening right now um, in this snapshot of time and so in addition importantly uh, the metabolites are reflective of the environmental impact on a phenotype um, and that's extremely powerful so Let's think a little bit more about this concept of the environmental impact. So the environmental influences on the metabolome are going to vary uh, depending on the ecosystem, of course. But if we think about the human system, ecosystem, the environmental influences are going to include things like the weight of a person, where they are in their menstrual cycle, what um, their mood, the activity level or lifestyle, their drug intake, um, diet, very important, exposure to pollutants and toxins. So all of these things are going to influence the metabolome that we measure at a given point in time. And then in addition, while things like medication and diet and pollution um, can influence metabolite product, products from the human biological pathways, they can also result in endogenous compounds uh, that will increase the complexity of the human metabolome. <clears throat> 
So we can also think about this concept in the term of a plant ecosystem. Um, in this case, environmental influences are going to include things like location where the plants are grown, the sun exposure and temperature, uh, water, if they're irrigated or not irrigated, um, are there insect pests around, were there severe weather events, snow, hail. Um, very importantly, what is the community of soil microbes that these plants are coming into contact with, um, and soil fertility. Um, what is the fertility of the soil? Were there fertilizers applied? And so you can imagine that with our changing climate and shifts in weather patterns, this is hugely important um, to study. And so, for example, this crazy heat wave that we just had last week in uh, the Pacific Northwest, where temperatures got up to 100 degrees, which was 120 degrees, excuse me, which was just completely uh, abnormal. Um, you you can believe that that type of temperature shift is going to influence the plants that are growing there and trigger metabolomic changes uh, that may impact growth or production. So this is becoming more and more important. OK, so metabolomics is important, but unfortunately, metabolomics is also kind of hard. So under, unlike DNA and protein based omics, where the type of molecule being analyzed is relatively consistent in terms of structure. So right with DNA, we've only got four things, four different types of molecules we have to analyze. Uh, with protein, proteins, it's a little bit more complex, but again, we're looking at peptides and peptides all share this sort of similar struct uh, structural um, theme in the peptide backbone. So they're structurally similar. So this gives, gives us an analytical advantage. But when we're talking about metabolites, metabolites can encompass many different types of compounds, um, which are very chemically diverse. And so this creates some unique analytical challenges um, that don't tend to be as much of an issue with the other omics technologies. And so this chemical diversity includes molecules with a wide, ra wide range in polarity, hydrophobicity, and size, all of which dictate the specific analytical approach that will enable the most um, effective detection of each type of molecule. And so at the end of the day, what this means is that we there really isn't one uh, technology that will comprehensively detect all the metabolites in a system. And so we often have to make choices and use a combination of approaches to, to detect a diversity of molecules. All right, so how do we approach a metabolomics experiment? There's two main ways that we can approach this. So the first would be what we would call a targeted approach. Uh, this is not new. People have been doing targeted um, analysis of small molecules for a long time. Um, this requires, of course, uh, previous knowledge. You have to know what you're looking for. Um, it also requires uh, authentic standards. Um, and if you want to do absolute quantitation, it requires some form of labeled in, uh, internal standards, authentic standards. Um, so for ex an example of a targeted approach that's relevant right now, right, would be if we want to detect a doping or steroid use of Olympic athletes, we would then design, uh, or what they do is they've designed targeted assays using mass spectrometry for specific steroids and maybe some of their metabolites. And then they use this to analyze the serum or urine samples. So when they analyze these samples, they're only looking for specific molecules and they can quantify exactly how much is there. And so these assays can be highly specific and sensitive um, and capable of generating absolute quantitation. Um, of course, um, again, if the appropriate internal standards and calibrations curves are used. All right, but the other option is what we call non-targeted or untargeted metabolomics. And this is really what we think about when we think about the concept of omics or metabolomics um, as an omics type of study. And in this type of study, we essentially open the floodgates and try to let as much as we can into our, our um, detection system. Although if you know, even as illustrated in this uh, entertaining picture, even when we do this, we're still not gonna capture everything, right? So there's a lot that's not getting into her mouth. Um, in this type of experiment, we don't have a predefined set of targets. 
And in fact, we are actually pretty blind to what we are detecting. We're not necessarily detecting specific compounds. We detect peaks or fragments of these, of these compounds, not specific compounds. And so this creates some significant challenges uh, in data interpretation that we're going to talk about. Um, but the big reason that we do this non-targeted approach um, is that there is the potential for novel discoveries, right? If we just keep focusing on all the things that we already know are important, then how are we ever going to discover anything new? So most of what I'm going to be talking about, all of what I'm going to be talking about uh, for the rest of the presentation is really focused on this concept of metabolomics as an untargeted or non-targeted uh, approach. All right, so now we'll get to the mass spec, right? So you guys have learned a lot about mass spectrometry technology and how it works. So how do we utilize mass spectrometry to study metabolites in this concept of a non-targeted um, profiling experiment? Um, we'll talk about some of the various options, but in general, every metabolomics uh, experiment is going to have a mixture of molecules, complex mixture of molecules, very complex, um, that will have been extracted from a biological system. We're going to separate those molecules over time using some type of chromatography, and then we're going to detect the molecules using uh, mass spectrometry. And so as you have learned, this is going to generate a chromatogram where we have time on the x-axis, intensity on the y-axis, and um, underneath each of these peaks in our chromatogram, it's going to we're going to have a spectrum where we have M over Z or mass to charge ratio and intensity, and each of these peaks in the spectrum could represent a different metabolite in our biological system. So using this sort of very broad general approach, we analyze all the samples in our experiment. And at the end of the day, what we have is a collection of detected features or peaks for which we know the mass. Um, and if we're using a high resolution instrument, we know that mass pretty accurately. We know a relative intensity and we know a retention time. But with this data, we don't have any information about what those compounds are or the compound structure. So in other words, we have a lot of peaks, but we don't know what they are. And so again, if we have good um, mass accuracy, we may not know what the peaks are, but with that mass accuracy, we can calculate with good confidence the molecular formula, right? So in other words, the number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, for example, that make up a molecule. However, just knowing what those uh, molecular formula is, again, doesn't tell us anything about the biological identity or function of this molecule. And this is analogous to the situation when you know all the letters of a word, but it's only when you know the order of the word letters that that word has meaning, right? So it's the same with molecules. It's not until we know uh, which order or how these elements are put together that we know actually what molecule we have and what the biological, how to interpret that biologically. So thankfully, um, and presumably you guys have learned all about this this week, is that in our mass spectrometer, we can do more than just measure mass. We can also fragment molecules and generate MSMS or fragmentation spectra. Um, and in this case, we have a, in what happens when we do this is we have a parent molecule and we break it up into smaller pieces or fragment. And this process is structure specific. And so we're going to generate a, a fingerprint of peaks that's directly related to the structure of our molecule that we're detecting. And so this example um, it shows glutamate, which is a very commonly observed metabolite in almost every uh, biological system we study. Um, and we and measure its um, M over Z ratio very uh, accurately. And then what we see here is a fragmentation pattern for glutamate where each of these peaks represents a substructure of this parent molecule. And that helps us have confidence that in what we're, uh, how we're defining this peak in our data. And this is super important when we're talking about metabolites where we can have multiple molecules that have the exact same molecular formula, but very, very different chemical structures. Um, and, but however, since they have different structures, these fragmentation patterns are gonna be unique and this data, this type of data can help us distinguish between them. So here we're showing glutamate again, um, and then three other molecules that have the exact same molecular formula, 
exact same m over z value, but their fragmentations are very, patterns are very different. So we can tell the difference between them in our data. Okay. So looking at this metabolomics workflow a little bit more in depth, um, there are many ways to do a metabolomics experiment, and obviously we can't cover all of them now, but they're all going to have these same common components or themes. Um, so there's going to be some important study design and sample collection criteria. Um, I'm assuming that this has been covered by other people in this workshop, and we can talk more about it in the questions if we want, but this step is critical. Obviously, this is where you can make or break uh, the value of your of your data long term. If it's a poor study sign or your samples are not collected correctly, it doesn't matter how good your data analytically is. Um, it's not going to be it's not going to be meaningful. So I can't overstate the importance of these two steps. Um, we, but once we have our samples collected appropriately, um, we're going to process them and extract them. So this step usually involves some form of either dilution, um, maybe freeze dry or lyophilization, homogenization and extraction with um, various types of solvents. Once we have a sample that's amenable or ready for analysis, we're going to do our separation, chromatographic separation. Now, typically or most commonly, this is going to use some form of liquid uh, or gas chromatography although there are some other flavors of chromatography that are used in metabolomics as well. And then we're going to detect our compounds using mass spectrometry. We're going to process, annotate, and interpret the data. And so while we like to think of our untargeted or non-targeted metabolomics as unbiased, in reality, the choices that we make at each step of this uh, workflow are going to bias the experiment to a particular set of metabolites. So for example, the process or the solvent that we use to extract our metabolites, the instrument platform we choose uh, for separation and detection, and the tools that we use for data processing are all going to influence the data that we ultimately have at the end. And so this is a really uh, important piece of designing a metabolomics experiment. And so to look at this a little bit more, we can think about the two most commonly used analytical platforms. Uh, liquid chromatography and gas chromatography coupled with mass spec. Now, obviously within each of these categories, there are different flavors, but in general, they are considered to be complementary. So for example, uh, LCMS is gonna result in the detection of compounds like lipids, bile acids, steroids, endocannabinoids, whereas GCMS is gonna excel in the detection of a much different set of metabolites, including volatiles and small organic compounds like, uh, or organic acids, uh, sorry, small polar compounds like organic acids and amino acids. And so the choice of analytical workflow is important and should be intentional as there's not, again, one platform that's going to capture the whole of the metabolome. I will also say that optimization of analytical detection, so in other words, how can we collect more and better data in less time, is something that is an active area of research um, by analytical chemists like my group and others um, that are working in this area. Okay, so we make our choices, um, but no matter what choices we make, at the end of the day, we're going to ultimately result um, in data of similar structure, right? So we're going to end up again with our chromatogram and our mass spectrum and where we have lots of peaks or features that we've detected. Um, and the output of our data acquisition, again, is going to be a lot of data across many, many data files, right? So the other caveat or the other piece of this is that in a metabolomics experiment, right, we're not just analyzing one or two samples, we're analyzing lots of samples, usually tens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of samples. So we're going to have a lot of data over a lot of data files. And so the first critical step in data analysis is our data pre-processing. Um, and this is hugely important and it includes um, steps such as peak picking, alignment across the samples, and retention time correction. This also includes other steps like normalization, which we'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide, and outlier detection. So 
I also want to mention that there are numerous tools for doing this pre-processing step, um, but there really isn't a general consensus of the best approach yet in the field. And so again, this remains an active area of research. There are a, a lot of vendor-based software tools to do this step, as well as open source tools like XCMS and MS Dial. Um, so at the end of the day, after we do this pre-processing step, what we end up with is a data matrix like this, right? So we have samples, we have our features, we still don't know what they are, um, but we know their accurate mass and we know their retention time. And then we have some sort of quantitative value. So at this point, the data looks very similar to other types of omics data. So a few additional words about normalization. This is a very important, but often underappreciated aspect of the pre-processing workflow. The purpose of this step is really to reduce the variation from non-biological sources. So for example, variation in the amount of starting material, run order, matrix effects, or batch effects. Now, again, there are multiple approaches for doing this step, and all of them have various advantages and disadvantages. Um, probably the easiest and most widely used approach is to normalize based on the total ion current. This is the approach we utilize in our lab as it uh, tends to be very generalizable across platforms and sample types. And I mentioned we analyze lots of different sample types. So another approach is the use of internal standards. Um, this can be, again, um, a single internal standard or a panel of compounds. And these internal standards could be non-endogenous peaks or compounds, or they could be stable isotope labeled internal standards. Um, and then a third approach would be a statistical approach. Um, and so these uh, have the advantage of being able to utilize quality control samples and basically normalize your actual data relative to QC samples. So without going into the multiple advantages and disadvantages of all of these, um, my goal here was really basically just to point out that this is a very important step of the pre-processing workflow. Um, and really no method is really right or wrong necessarily. It's just important to understand whether you're collecting your data or someone else is collecting it for you, which approach is being used and how that might impact uh, the interpretation of your results. Okay, so at this point, we have a nice quantitative data set that we can start to explore using comparative statistical tools. So this is an example that I pulled from a, um, this paper here um, of data that was analyzed using univariate statistics and represented as a volcano plot. So volcano plots where you have log two full change on the x-axis and um, minus log 10 p-value on the y-axis. And so this is a great way to explore the data, especially when you have a pairwise comparison, as it helps focus on metabolites that have specific p-values and also large full changes. Um, and it can also differentiate in the direction of the full change. And so this plot in particular was generated using an open source software package called Metabol Analyst, which is a great easy to use resource for doing these types of, of statistical um, interrogations. It's also very common to utilize multivariate statistical tools, especially when your experiment has more than two groups. So for example, principal component analysis, um, and I've shown just a little cartoon of what that looks like here, is a way to visualize the variation in the entire data set in two dimensions. And so you see this, some form of principal component analysis plot in almost every metabolomics paper. We can also use more advanced statistical models and machine learning algorithms to create predictive models based on metabolite data. So these types of models can be used, for example, to classify unknowns or, and or to highlight important metabolites um, or data features that are contributing to the separation between groups as they are defined in the model. So these models are what we would call supervised. So sam samples are designed, uh, sorry, assigned to a group. Um, and then we build the model around these assignments. Okay, so we made a lot of important choices about how we were going to analyze our data, what an, uh, analytical tools we were going to use. And at this point in time, we can get to this stage of an experiment relatively quickly. 
right? So it's relatively straightforward to process samples, analyze the data, acquire it all, do some stats and figure out what's important and what's not um, pretty easily. But this really brings us to what remains as the grand challenge in metabolomics, and that is this process of translating our mass spec data into interpretable biological knowledge. So in other words, this list of peaks or M over Z values are not really all that interesting in, con in the context of biology. So we need to figure out what metabolites these peaks represent. And so this is the concept of metabolite annotation. So one of the first challenges we are faced with when trying to interpret our mass spec data as biological compounds is the complexity of the data. So we routinely detect maybe tens or thousands or tens of thousands, excuse me, um, of different peaks uh, in our data set. But and everything I've kind of talked about so far assumes or implies that each of the peaks we detect corresponds to a different metabolite. Um, and this is, in fact, probably untrue. And so here I'm showing a spectrum of a single purified authentic standard. So this compound is uh, dimethyl succinic acid. Um, and this compound was analyzed using the same workflow that we might use um, on LCMS um, analytical platform that we might use to collect non-targeted metabolomics data. And what you can see is that we don't just have one peak, we have many more than one peaks. Um, and this may be somewhat of an extreme example, um, but you can see that some of these peaks are easily interpretable. Right, so we can identify, okay, here's our compound minus water. Here's the compound plus sodium. Here's a dimer plus potassium, um, but others are not as easily identified or uh, interpreted. And then also remember that even if we could interpret all the peaks, remember that these in a real sample, these peaks would be mixed with the peaks of all the other compounds in our very complex biological matrix. Thus, the risk of interpretation of this type of data is very high. And in reality, if we're detecting, you know, 30,000 or 50,000 different peaks in our metabolomics data set, this most likely is a gross overestimation of the number of actual metabolites that are, that are in our sample that we're detecting. So one way that we can address this challenge is to use a data-driven peak clustering approach. So again, there are multiple tools for doing this. Um, and what I'm illustrating here is an approach that uses both retention time and co-variation across the data set. So in this simple cartoon, we've got four different peaks that are perfectly co-eluting. Uh, thus, if we were only using retention time to group these peaks together, we might expect that all these peaks originated from the same molecule. However, if we look at this quantitative variation of these same peaks between, for example, a control and a treated sample um, or a group of samples, you can see that the variation across the, these treatments, um, the quantitative variation is quite different. And this tells us that these peaks are not necessarily uh, rising from the same compound. And so we can look at this computationally by just looking at the quantitative correlation of these peaks across our data set. And we can see that when we do this, um, peak or feature one and two correlate very nicely, as do features three and four. But if we tried to do this for features one versus four, we would not get a very strong correlation. And so this type of approach allows us to basically intelligently cluster uh, the peaks into groups that represent individual metabolites. So the result of this approach, this type of approach, is a drastically reduced data set um, that might most likely more accurately reflects the number of metabolites in our system that we're actually detecting. Um, and so we can use the quantitative data from this, these new peak clusters in our statistical analysis. And then additionally, we can generate either a representative or a consensus MSMS spectrum um, from the peaks in each cluster to assign our compound structure using uh, basically getting us to this metabolite annotation piece. Okay, so metabolite annotation. Again, 
uh, one of the biggest challenges that's remaining for us in metabolomics. And so the most confident way that we can assign a biological identity to our data is to compare our experimental data for an to data for an authentic standard collected on our analytical platform, right? So in this case, we think we might have identified phenylalanine. How do we confirm that we actually have phenylalanine? We buy a standard, we analyze it on our system. Uh, we compare the retention time of the experimental sample to a standard and also the MSMS or that fragmentation pattern, that structure specific fragmentation pattern. Um, and so in the bottom uh, figure there, you can see the experimental sample a spectrum on the top and the fragmentation spectra for the standard on the bottom. So this is considered the gold standard for identification, but it is often only possible for a handful of compounds in the data, and it's definitely not a fast process. Um, and in addition, authentic standards are not always available. So the next step is to come or the so, next uh, Jessica, can I interrupt for yes. a quick question? We have a, several coming in, um, oh. but one that's relevant here is um, a question about how peptides have specific fragmentation and maybe a comment on small molecules and if you can have diagnostic fragment ions. Um, that are sort of universal across different metabolites, as you would see with peptides. Yes, I can comment on that. And so um, I will actually get to that in like one slide. Oh, perfect. So, OK, so I will get to that in the next slide. But before I get there, um, I have a so the next sort of best option, if we can't do this sort of gold standard option, is to compare our experimental data to spectral libraries. So these would be libraries that are generated by other people um, and they contain spectra of authentic standards. Um, and so this can be relatively high throughput, um, but it's estimated that only about, for example, if we're talking about human metabolites, about 10% of known human metabolites are represented in spectral libraries. And this number is probably even less when we think about um, plant metabolites or microbial or bacterial metabolites. And so, and ultimately, probably the generation of truly comprehensive spectral libraries is, is pretty intractable, um, given the complexity of the metabolomes um, and, the, and especially across species, and the fact that there are still a lot of metabolites that we don't even know exist, as well as the lack of an, uh, authentic standards. Okay, so getting to the questions, which are really awesome, great questions is this concept of sort of the, now the next approach would be this concept of in silico fragmentation. And so this is the approach that we use in proteomics most of the time, right? Is that we have our, our theoretical uh, trips and peptides. So we have a sequence, a protein sequence that we, we know that we can predict based on the genome. Um, and then we have, we can predict what peptides we're gonna get from a trypsin digest. And then because peptides share this this peptide backbone, we can predict if that peptide were to fragment in a mass spectrometer, what is it going to look like? Now, unfortunately, with metabolites, again, because we have this huge chemical diversity, um, it's very difficult to predict uh, what those fragmentation events are going to be. Um, it's not impossible, but it's much, much harder. And in addition to the, the to adding to the challenge of this, um, is the fact that, again, in metabolomics, we're, we tend to use a wide variety of analytical tools. So whereas in, in proteomics, we're almost, almost all the time using an electrospray ionization. And yes, there are differences across platforms. It's a little bit more um, comparable um, and reproducible. But in metabolite annotation, we're using lots of different types of analytical approaches, and each of them are going to generate slightly different fragmentation patterns. And it's really hard to account for that. So even changing some of the settings in your source on the same instrument are gonna influence that fragmentation pattern. And so as an illustration, and it would I sh maybe should have an example in here, um, if you go to one of the spectral libraries that are out there. So for example, one of the spectral libraries is um, the human metabolome database. If you go to the human metabolome database and look at all of the, um, spectra that they have there for a given molecule. You'll see that there's not just a representative spectra, there's gonna be maybe 20 
and there's going to be spectra from um, maybe a GCMS instrument and maybe an LCMS instrument in positive mode and maybe an LCMS instrument in negative mode. And so there's going to be a lot of different representative spectra, and then you pick the one that most closely matches your analytical system to do that matching. Um, so it's a it's a more complex um, process to predict uh, what uh, fragments are going to be there. But that's that's a great question because that's basically what we need to be able to do to get over this this hump of focusing or relying on the spectral libraries of authentic standards, which will probably never um, encompass everything. So again, in silico fragmentation, and there are lots of people working on this and the tools um, are getting better and better all the time. They're, they're getting really, really good. Um, and this is probably going to be one of the areas that's going to have the largest impact on the field as these tools get better and better. Hopefully that answers questions. And I welcome input from other uh, experts on the call as well. Um, and so finally, now that we have annotated at least some of our data, we can start this important process of trying to figure out um, what this means in the context of the biological question we're asking in the first place, right? So for example, we can explore metabolite data in the context of biological pathways. Um, so this is where it also becomes very valuable to have additional omics data at our disposal, like transcriptomics or proteomics. Um, and so putting all those pieces of the, of the puzzle together can be really, really powerful. We can also look at the correlation of metabolites across sample groups and networks based on chemical structures. Um, so basically, looking at networks of base that are reflective of our MSMS data. And this can sometimes be very powerful in helping us propagate metabolite annotations to unknowns um, and even potentially discovering new uh, metabolites that might not be represented in our databases yet. And so in addition, at this stage, it's often very valuable to explore our data, not just in within the context of our data set, but also using data from other studies. Um, through the use of data mining tools and other large data repositories. So for example, we might have a compound that we can't identify, but if someone else has also detected that same um, compound in the sense of it has a similar retention time, it was from a similar type of sample, and it has a matching MSMS spectra, and maybe they didn't know what it was either, but now we have two independent studies that, I, that have detected this thing, um, so it's probably a real thing. And that's valuable knowledge, even if we don't know what it is. And so again, there are also some, lots of tools that are emerging to do these types of um, tasks. And so GNPS is just one option of the open source to, tool that can help us with mining these data sets and, and doing these types of networking analyses. So realizing that this was a very broad overview of some of these, of metabolomics and some of the major challenges, um, what are my take home messages? So first of all, the take home message is that metabolomics may be hard, but it's also extremely powerful and important to do. Um, and that is because it is reflective of our biological phenotype and importantly, the environmental influence on this phenotype. Um, there are a lot of analyt both analytical and computational challenges. Uh, in metabolomics that are somewhat unique to metabolomics due to this chemical complexity of the metabolome. And because of this, the choices that you make in the experimental design, the analytical tool you use, and how you treat the data are going to impact or bias the result. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just an important thing that's important to, um, to understand. And so you make these choices intentionally. Um, and also you are transparent when you report your results. And then finally, this concept of confident metab metabolite annotation or translating our mass spec data into interpretable biological knowledge really does remain a grand challenge in metabolomics. And we're going to be, there's been a ton of progress made and, but there are people actively working on this and trying to get better at this all the time. And so really uh, the, the main take home message too is that because of all of these caveats and challenges within metabolomics, it's critically important that we report all of the details of your experiment and how you treated your data and to submit your raw data to publicly accessible 
uh, repositories. Um, and this is important to ensure the transparency of your work and also enable the potential for data reuse as our computational tools improve. That is all I've got. So I'm happy to answer any so additional much. questions. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions, oh, so I think okay. uh, this is a great opportunity to have you uh, kind of dive in on some of these. Um, so one that's been asked um, in a few different ways is uh, different orthogonal techniques. Um, different orthogonal techniques uh, like GCMS versus LCMS and incorporating other non mass spec based technologies like NMR and what might how you might incorporate those or choose to do one versus the other. OK, I am I is there a place where I can see the questions or uh, there is a live event Q and A. Oh, there it is. OK, I forgot about and that. There <laughs> are. Uh, OK. Presented. Um, okay. So yeah, questions so, about GC versus LC came up. Right. OK, so that that's a great question. And um, I don't know that there's really a, a, a right answer or wrong answer. Um, sometimes it comes down to, you know, in terms of which which platform should I choose? So sometimes it comes down to what do I have available to me <laughs> to use? Um, and sometimes it comes down to cost. How much money do I have to analyze these samples? Um, and so sometimes the choices are based on practical considerations like that. Um, sometimes, you know, like I think that you guys had a presentation already on lipids, I'm pretty sure. So sometimes maybe, you know, like the metabolites that I'm really interested on are really nonpolar. They're mostly lipids or they're big carbohydrates. And so in that case, then it would become clear that the choice you want to use is LCMS versus GCMS. Um, you know, alternatively, if you know that, you know, you want to look at volatile compounds because you're studying flavor chemistry, then you're going to want to use GCMS. And so you know, so you can make choices based on the design of your experiment, and that's why it's always important to go into these types of experiments with some sort of, um, you know, obviously hypothesis and goal. Like, what am I hoping to learn from this? Um, and that can help define the analytical platform that you choose. Now, if you have, you know, unlimited resources, then you do as many different analytical platforms as you as you can to improve improve your coverage. Does that so answer I guess, the I guess um, an, another kind of question on, on top of that we're seeing a lot of is thinking about libraries. Um, so one question was, are LC libraries not well um, annotated as well as GC libraries? Um, maybe what are some recommended libraries for metabolite annotation? Um, I've got a couple questions. About OK, it. that's a really good question, and I did sort of like kind of skim over that. So one of the advantages of GCMS is that um, you know, GCMS libraries have been around for a long time and they're very high quality and very comprehensive and uh, GC electron impact ionization, which happens in GCMS, is very reproducible across instruments. And so those libraries tend to be very stable and generalizable across pretty much any data that you get off of a GCMS instrument. Um, as opposed to LCMS, which really suffers, technologies would suffer more from that sort of instrument to instrument variability in terms of you know, and the different types of modes, positive or negative mode, and what voltage you have in your source and all of that, that can really change what your spectra looks like. And so the LCMS uh, libraries are just newer. We don't, we haven't been building them for as long time, but they, there are very, very big libraries out there. So there's the NIST LCMS MS library is, is, I can't remember exactly what, how many compounds they have, but it's a lot. It's like, in the tens of thousands of different compounds that are represented. And if you look for each of them, there's like ion trap, Q, QTOF, you know, Orbi trap, FT, FT, ICRMS spectra. So there's representative spectra for the same compound on lots of different instruments. And so it takes a lot more time to build these out, um, which is one of the reasons that they're lagging behind a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought on the so there's some examples of, of libraries so the NIST library um, there's the Metlin library which you can search um, you can purchase it or you can search it for free um, one by one there's the um, HMDB library which I already mentioned 
Um, Mass Bank is another one. Um, I'm probably forgetting some. And then some of the vendors have their own libraries um, that are available as well. And so one of the challenges with the libraries um, is the format in which they're accessible. And so, you know, being able to take, you know, maybe you have many thousands of MSMS spectra in your in your data and you want to search these against spectral libraries, that is another piece of the puzzle is that how do I actually interrogate these spectral libraries? And some of the formats are easier to use than others. Thank you, Jessica. That was excellent. Um, we also have some questions about products in the MS spectra. I know you brought that up in an earlier slide that you might have 30,000 things that you observe, but not all of those are unique metabolites. And so how yeah. would you go about identifying those addicts and maybe how do you deal with them in your data processing? Uh, do you sum those signals? Do you choose one? Um, those are really great questions. So, so yes, yeah, so oftentimes we're going to see addicts. And again, really this stems from, again, this sort of fact that we're trying to, to be as unbiased as possible. And so for those people who have worked with mass spec, you know, if you're doing a targeted approach, you can really dial in the instrument settings so that you really just get like M plus H or M minus H primarily. But when you're trying to detect a whole bunch of things at once, you sort of use a generalizable set of settings. And so what that means is that sometimes some compounds are not going to like that as much. And sometimes you see M plus H, maybe sometimes you don't even see M plus H, but a lot of times you'll see addicts like sodium or potassium. Sometimes you see dimers and loss of water and loss of ammonia. And sometimes you get in-source fragmentation that's not necessarily super predictable. Um, and so again, there are lots of ways to deal with that. Uh, some there, some programs will just go and look for, you know, those easily recognizable mass differences. So they'll look for like plus 22 and assign that as, uh, you know, as a way to identify a sodium addict, for example. And so they'll look for those patterns of mass differences. Um, and then some tools will be a little bit sort of less prescribed, like the one I defined, which is really letting the data drive the grouping of the peaks together. And then after you've done that, you would go back and say, okay, I think these peaks all define the same metabolite. And then we can either manually or using other tools go and pick out, okay, this is M plus AH, this is basically make those assignments. Um, but that that is that is definitely it's something that has to be done, and there are lots of ways to do it. <laughs> That's kind of a cheater answer. Um, but a lot of the tools just do it different ways. I see a lot I think of that's questions. a great answer. I, I know that's a struggle in the field right now is, is to deal with it the is. many, yeah. many features and, that we observe. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions in here about NMR, mm -hmm. um, which I didn't, I actually almost put something about NMR in there. So I will preface this by saying that I, I don't think I've done NMR since I was an undergrad taking organic chemistry. <laughs> so we don't, we haven't done that much NMR. Um, I do think that there's some advantages of NMR. I mean, the big advantage of NMR is that it's a quantitative technique, right? So if you can get good NMR data, it is quantitative. Like you don't have to use your internal standards. You can just get absolute quantitation directly from your NMR data. Um, but the main disadvantage of NMR, and I'm talking about this in the context of doing like a non-targeted experiment with NMR. Um, the main disadvantage of NMR for those types of applications, obviously, is that it's not anywhere near as sensitive as mass spec. And so it's it, you're just not going to ever get the depth of coverage that you will with a mass spec. Where NMR is could be is very, very valuable is when you have this unknown compound potentially and you have no idea what it is, but it's really, really important in your stats and you think it's like going to change the world. Then you can, in theory, use NMR to help with the structural characterization of that molecule. And so there are people doing some really cool things. Um, so the, the issue is there is that you have to purify that compound from your sample and then you have to concentrate it so you have enough for NMR. And there's some groups doing some really cool things where they have like fraction collectors, you know, so that you can you separate a sample and then like collect fractions and like over multiple iterations of injection so that you can purify and get enough of this to do NMR. Um, but that's definitely it, not high throughput um, and you know requires some sort of specific and advanced technologies. So it's not necessarily accessible to everyone, but that definitely is like 
if you, you really want to figure out what that unknown is, that would be the way to do it. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. There's, I'm seeing a lot of other questions here about um, maybe experimental design and how you would, if you have a new biological system, how you would reduce bias you're introducing. And I think a related question to that was one about choosing extraction methods and how that also influences your data out. Um, OK, so ex well, experimental design, that really comes back to um, the question of defining uh, a question <laughs> of your research, right? So you want to define, uh, design your experiment in such a way that you can actually use the data to answer the questions that you have. So having that sort of hypothesis set up from the beginning will help you um, with that experimental design um, aspect. And so it's very it's very application specific. I mean, of course, you want to make sure that you have enough replicates that you're capturing the biological replication in your system. And so that's going to be different if you're doing cell culture experiments or if you're looking at human clinical samples or plant samples or systems where there's a lot of sort of uh, indiv inner individual uh, variability. So and, and that really is where you also uh, should consult with a statistician or a biostatistician to help you accurately capture that variability in your experimental design. So you don't end up with data that's not usable. Um, and then the next question was, oh, about extraction. Um, so again, so extraction, whether you use GC or LC, those are all really related to, you know, what type of molecule you wanna see. If you don't know what type of molecule you wanna see, um, you know, maybe you do a biphasic extraction so that you have a nonpolar fraction and a polar fraction, and then you can analyze those separately um, using multiple platforms and get a very comprehensive view of your data. If you don't, if you're budget constrained, you know, maybe you do an 80% methanol um, sort of catch all type of extraction, knowing that you're going to miss some stuff, but it's kind of a good sort of if you can only do one thing, what would you do? So again, it's really dependent on if you know things that you want to look for specifically and practical constraints, constraints like budget and what you have accessible to you. I guess related to extraction, there's a question about changing pH um, and how that might change addicts. In this case, um, addicts. Yeah, definitely. I mean, definitely that could change the addicts. Um, I think that it would, again, you have lots of different types of molecules with different polarities and different pKa's in there. And so changing the pH is going to change, is going to impact some in one way and some in another. And so it's, it's, um, I guess I don't really have a better answer to that. <laughs> but yes, it will change things. Um, is it a strategy to help reduce addicts? Maybe. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, there's probably some people have looked at this. Um, I'm just not familiar with that research. Um, but in general, you're probably going to help some con type of compounds and make some others worse. And we have another one which is maybe more forward thinking um, and that is uh, is there any swish list item that would definitely improve your workflows or and this could be on and the question was posed as like an instrument level kind of wish list um, but maybe you have other things you can comment on um i mean i think for me my wish list is really more on the computational side. Um, and also, you know, so I wish that there was a more generalizable and um, way to process the data so that data could be more easily compared across experiments and in mind um, in a larger sense other than just our own data. And so there are there are sort of uh, 
pockets of, of groups that are working on this. Um, but, you know, if not, but there's generally not, there's definitely not like a general consensus of what is the best way to, to analyze my data. And so a new metabolomics user, uh, either they are working with someone and they were going to use the workflow and the data analysis pipeline that's developed and used by that group, or they're going to spend a lot of time trying all the different ones and trying to figure out which one is going to work the best for them. And usually it comes down to which one is easiest to use, right? And so um, I, I that's where I think forward thinking, I hope that we can get to is um, some more consensus on um, the best way to do the data analysis, um, especially because you know you can take the same exact state of data, and this is true for proteomics too, and run it through different pipelines, and you're going to get different results. Yes, thank you. I I agree. I think the metabolomics field is has a lot more diversity in the in the approaches that are used, um, in contrast to sort of proteomics, which I think is a lot more well developed. Although there is still new technologies yes. kind of occurring there, but I I feel like the metabolomics is just wide open, um, yes. and that makes it exciting, but also has its challenges. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. So I'm looking through the questions. Um, there's one question about uh, resolution, the instrument resolution that maybe you use to get high quality MS results, or is there any sort of optimum that you found? Right. So in our in our lab, we so I would I'll preface by saying we haven't really explored that question too much. Um, you know, we utilize QTOF instruments for our metabolomics, non-targeted LCMS metabolomics data. Um, we typically, I, I might be wrong on this, but I think we would collect those around 40,000 resolution. Um, so not super, super high. And I think that there is definitely a, a potential value in collecting. I mean, so for example, there are groups that are doing FTICR based metabolomics small molecules and that is can generate some really really high quality data especially when looking at really complex matrices like soils um and, and so you can get a ton of data out like that the, you know obviously there's always going to be this trade-off though of speed and and resolution and so that's the kind of the the limitation i guess so you can go really high resolution and you're going to go slower so you can't analyze as many samples and you know you're not going to see as much where and maybe you and you can't use you know you fast uplc separations um or you try and go a little lower resolution and you see more and you can use faster separation and analyze more and more samples so there's always that trade-off um so i really again it, it kind of depends and maybe that's an area you know as we can get higher resolution on with faster scan speeds then that could definitely help yeah, I think that's always the wish list. Uh, yeah, more with less. Uh, oh, OK, so. So I don't know, we have just maybe one more minute left. There was a question that came up about uh, normalization approaches and maybe leveraging QC to normalize at a um, per metabolite basis versus um, sort of a global abundance tick normalization. Yeah. So definitely, I think that there's a lot of power in potentially using QCs. So we typically use, for example, pooled QCs, which are um, basically like a little bit of all the samples mixed together, and then you can inject them every, you know, six or 10 samples. And so it gives you a good readout of the analytical stability across your data. So at the very least, it allows you to look and say, okay, something went wrong, and I definitely need to, like, figure out what went wrong and maybe rerun some of my data, but some of the statistical methods and there are some papers, I put a couple references in, but there are lots if you look that are able to utilize that QC data to kind of to do that normalization step. And I think that that is, is potentially a really powerful um, approach. 